Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted that we are here today. I would encourage us, if you would, like, can we move a little closer to the middle? So that maybe some of our parents who are dropping kids off or other guests who are coming Sorry. in can swing in on the end when, they, when they're able to get here. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad that we are all here today. And for everyone who is joining us on Zoom, I'm glad that you are here with us. It is my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Dr. James Whalen um, to speak with us today. He is a professor of psychology at the University of Memphis. He's one of the foremost experts here in Tennessee on um, researching addictions, particularly gambling addictions for research and treatment. He runs the, and I'm going to have to read it off the screen because I can't remember it all. He runs the TIGER, which is the Institute for Gambling Education and Research at the University of Memphis. And most importantly for us, he is Zoe's father. So we are just delighted to have him here with us today. We're honored to have you come and speak to us a little bit Thanks, about sir. your research and your experience. Great. Thanks. So I want to open, sorry, I went to hand you the microphone. I forgot. Part of my yeah, job is to open me. us in prayer. Oh. Let's pray, friends. Gracious and loving God, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather, to hear about experiences that we may have had, that our loved ones may have had, that people that we are around and know may be wrestling with, and the ways that we can be present and loving community of faith around those struggles. We ask that you be with us in this room to open our hearts and minds to hear you, that we may continually, in everything we do, honor you and love our neighbor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and good morning. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, and it's great to have Zoe here. I don't remember the last time you've heard me. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> But it also means that later today or maybe tomorrow, I will get a very detailed report about my ability to curate visually and aesthetically coherent story. You laugh, but it's true. <laughs> um, there are a few things that in the world, I, there are a few things actually I can probably say after many years that I'm an international expert in. One of them, and I could speak on this if you'd like, but one of them are embarrassing stories about Zoe. So I can shift real easily. I got a whole nother PowerPoint here and get that done. But the other is, is, is gambling. About, oh, Gabe, how do I? So it was actually um, in the late 90s at the U of M, I was the, in the psychology department. We have a community facing mental health clinic uh, available to anybody on a sliding scale fee. I used to manage that clinic. And one day, um, my buddy, who is uh, Andy Myers, some of you may know Andy, uh, it's Lee Myers' husband. Um, Andy was also a faculty member in psychology. And Andy brings this graduate student into my office and says, Do we have anything about how to treat gambling problems? So um, the issue was a gentleman came in who um, was presenting with depression. That's what he called about. But in the intake evaluation, what we learned was that both the ups and downs of his life was, and this is before the Tennessee lottery. So he used to drive from Memphis to Missouri a couple times a week and drop several hundred dollars on lottery tickets and then drive back. And in fact, over time, he was accumulating more. Hey, and more Mark. Mark, how are you? Good to see you. Glad you're here. Good to Good see you. Way. Good to see you, Rick. Hey, how's it going? Well, family about this issue. I mean, it just went on and on. And of course, Andy and I, being academics and researchers, did what good academic researchers should do when we're faced with a question where we don't know what the literature says. And that is, we told the graduate students go to the library <laughs> and come back and tell us what the literature says. So, um, 
But that started our little group. It was Andy and myself and two graduate students. And, and it was, there were really two realizations. And you can lean towards either one you want. One was the fact that uh, casinos were being built in Tunica as well as the rest of the world. Um, and we were suddenly realized we didn't know what the literature said. We wondered if anybody knew what the literature said and that it would be good for our community to have somebody who knew how to do this. And then came the second realization, which maybe you judge, maybe the primary motivator, and that is we figured out that this is really low hanging fruit and two bozos like us can make a contribution to this literature. So that was the joke. <laughs> so, right, yeah. um, so, so we started, um, we started this, um, the gambling clinic and Tiger eventually was named Tiger after a smart graduate student who figured out the acronym. But the um, uh, but we really started realizing what we really needed to do is to start treating people with gambling problems, and then bring those questions back into the research lab to ask them, ask them in a way that yielded us empirical information, and then bring that information back into how we treated people. So we started the clinic in 1999, and, and since then we have evolved considerably. Uh, we are now actually the, the Tennessee Institute for Gambling Education and Research. Uh, we've been securing external funding for the last, I don't know, uh, 17, 18 years. Um, and, um, and we've replicated what we do here in Memphis with a doctoral student, a former doctoral student of mine who is on faculty at ETSU. And so she started a clinic there. We integrate our two clinics together and we've branded our gambling clinic. To set Tennessee up um, to be a leader in how to deal with gambling. Gambling is pervasive in the world. I'll get to that in a minute. And it's how do we help move this forward? And it's our creation of this. We have a mission for this institute and the gambling clinic specifically, and that is to build a, an engaging and a comprehensive system of care for individuals who have problems with gambling or have family member, friends, et cetera, who, may, who they are concerned with the harms they may be experiencing. What I hope to do today is talk to you a little bit about what do I mean by gambling? What do I mean about gambling harms? What do, how do we treat it? How do we move it forward? And just to give you a sense of what this is about, I welcome questions at any point in time. Um, uh, there are a few things I can talk all day about. I realize we have a time limit, but, but I can um, ask questions as you wish. Addiction, this is usually the first question I get. Um, I can tell you that when we started this, I reached out to friends of ours, Mark and Linda Sobel, world-renowned, probably top researchers in alcoholism. And I reached out to them and I said, I'm embarrassed that we were at dinner. We actually had dinner in Vegas. And I, I said, I, after a glass of wine, I said, all right, guys, I'm reading this stuff. I'm kind of new to addiction. What really is addiction? And Mark and Linda looked at each other and just laughed. And they said, ah, we don't know. We've been doing this for 20 some years. It's really hard to nail down. That took me back, and there are a bunch of definitions. I had a, I was gonna throw a couple of them up there, but I think this is the key one. And this is actually one that when I took a graduate course in, um, in addictive behaviors, which is an animal modeling class, the, um, the instructor who was in, himself in recovery said, an addiction is a persistent drive for engagement in a problem where harms occur because of that engagement yet you can continue to engage in that behavior. And I think that's a pretty robust decision or, or definition. And one of the things that doesn't rule out, which is kind of in, interests me a great deal, and that is when we talk about this definition, does it require a substance, all right? That generally we think about addiction, historically, we thought about a substance. More modernly, people are asking, and there's colloquially a lot of conversations about addictions about non-substances. Go back to my friends, Mark and Linda Sobel, another dinner, I forget where this one was, but we were talking about, um, uh, we were talking about a grant that I had submitted that they had reviewed, that they read, gave me feedback on. And, um, and Linda said, uh, you know, 
gambling in the 2000s looks a lot like alcohol in 1960. He said alcohol in 1960, the only way you can have a problem is if you drank hard liquor, as it was uh, called. You don't have an alcohol problem if you drink wine or beer. And the, and the same sort of presence is about gambling. And in fact, lots of people are still unclear about what a gambling addiction is about. I define gambling, and this is a cop out this definition, but it is betting um, on things of value, uh, usually money, on something where the outcome is at least partially determined by chance. And we live in a world today where there are multiple forms of gambling that's been available. And in fact, there are a lot of noise. I, I have gotten so much media attention in the last year around sports wagering and whether or not it's destroying society that we have to really realize this is actually <coughs> uh, it's existed <coughs> almost forever. Um, there are um, sheep knuckles made into dice that are in prehistoric uh, finds. Um, there's a whole history of Europe, whole history of Asia, et cetera, et cetera, where lots of aspects of culture and society was about gambling. This is nothing new. Sports wagering is nothing new. There is references to sports wagering at the Colosseum in what we call now call Rome. Um, there is, um, and if you want to talk about problems, I got interviewed. I was on a radio show in Nashville just this week where they were talking about the risks about players and coaches. And I'm like, don't you remember the Black Sox? Don't you remember how the NIT in 1960 blew up because, mm, yes, mobsters bought the whole starting lineup of the Long Island University basketball team. We've gone through this mul multiple times. It doesn't mean it's not alarming in some ways, but gambling's been around for a very long time. The, um, I, I wanted to throw this up there as well. This, is, um, this was a study done by a Canadian group and the respondents on this is a large study, 12,000, almost 13,000 people. Um, um, and they were asked, what is and what is not gambling? And what's really interesting here, there's some things that people think is clearly gambling, but all the way up to purchasing insurance. And, and the truth is, purchase insurance is gambling. You know, if you buy life insurance, you're, gonna be, you're, you're betting you die. <laughs> uh, what's really interesting here, this is a study from a little over a decade ago. I think the data was collected in 2010, um, where sports wagering, almost 50% of the people thought sports wagering was not gambling. I, I come up with that all the time now. Um, last night, a guy was telling me, he's a poker player, and he's saying, but, you know, poker players, not, you know, I'm, you know I, study, I study the game. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's still gambling, man. Did you put money down? You know, in fact, uh, anybody here play bridge? Anybody ever play bridge yeah yeah a couple of people bridge is thought to be a gentleman's ladies recreational game do you know what the the most common um gambling card game was in the 18th century it was a game called whist you know what whist is bridge <laughs> a little different so we, we we do have some hard times deciding what exactly is gambling uh, I don't think it's quite where I know it when I see it. Is day trading gambling? Oh, yeah. Is investing in the stock market gambling? Well, there's a couple of association of financial advisors who say, oh, no, because it's measured and determined. And I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Are you getting yourself in trouble with it is really where my issue goes. One of the things to talk about is pervasiveness to gambling. Uh, yes, Zoe. Oh, yeah. I, So, Manja, the way we play, the way it is played in the United States is a variation of the top form of gambling in Southeast Asia 100 years ago. Okay, it was actually um, in the, in, in, after World War II, um, there was investment in industry around Singapore and Hong Kong, and there was a guy there who stole the game, Americanized it in some ways. But yes, it was the form. And yes, it continues to be a major form of gambling. Oh. 
that's a great game. It's kind of cool. But the, the, the truth is, these are Canadians. Who knew what they, you know? <laughs> the, um, but one of the things about pervasiveness, I meant to ask the question before I showed the slide. There are only two states in the United States that's illegal to gamble. And that's Utah, no surprise to anyone, and Hawaii, which is also no surprise. There's so many things to do in Hawaii other than wager, but legally form of gambling is not in Hawaii. When we talk about, we, we talk about this recent iteration, people think it's all about sports wagering. I, I really think it's that what we've gone through since the um, 1970s when uh, casinos opened in Atlantic City, which meant the border around Utah was broken. Um, and followed by 20 years of expansion in the United States of casinos, that what we've really done is we've moved gambling to primarily being a trip, to, event, to being a drive. And there's one point in the, there's a paper from 19, or from 2004 that said there was a casino within 100 miles of every college campus in the United States. So it's a drive to now it's just a reach for the phone. Okay. Now we've always had easy access. Um, a lottery was used to fund the Revolutionary Army. The, the lotteries have been part of our culture since its inception in the United States. Um, and we borrowed it from the British, by the way. The British have been using lotteries to do public works for hundreds of years before that. So we borrowed that in order to fund the army. So it's very much part of our culture. But this change we're experiencing is that accessibility. And what does that accessibility mean? We talk about the legalization of sports wagering. I threw up this map, this is the current map. Uh, what you see is a great expansion. All the red states here, that's not a political statement, but all the, I stole this from the American Gaming Association, um, where there is live legal gambling. Um, and then you'll see uh, there are a couple states that's not quite on the books yet, Kentucky being one of them, and then some states that uh, there's either dead legislation or legislation in process. I actually got to testify three times this spring at different legislators groups in different jurisdictions about sports wagering and how to create safe sports wagering, et cetera. So people are very interested, and a bunch of these states are going to get it. This is not the final map. The final map's going to be all red. That's my guess. The thing that's unique about Tennessee so is that Tennessee is the only state where we have no brick and mortar wagering. There's no casinos, there's no sport book, there's no uh, place to place you have to go to place a bet on horse racing. It is all completely online. That's some interesting challenges to it from my perspective. There's a thing called responsible gambling. Responsible gambling is actually initiated by the gaming industry to say, let's partner with regulators in order to set up safeguards for people. And as a researcher, I've been doing responsible gambling re research since uh, 2001. Um, it's a really important vehicle, but it all gets undermined it when all of the um, responsible gaming efforts have to be on an app. You know, it's it's no longer a brick and mortar building that's standing behind it. If you go to a casino in Vegas, for example, you'll see signs about responsible gambling. You'll see information telling you be careful, and if you need help, where to reach out for help. And it's not as clear when we move to apps. Now let's talk about the continuum of gambling. Because, well, first of all, as a researcher and as a clinician, I'm gambling neutral. I actually uh, don't gamble. All spare change I have, all extra money I have, goes directly to Zoe, <laughs> <laughs> whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> but <laughs> what's what you say? That's a good idea. Um. But when we think about gambling and gambling harms, I think we really need to think about it as being on a continuum. The reality of the matter is we still have a little less than 15% uh, of the population who don't wager at all. Um, the vast majority of people wager in a very recreational way. They experience no harms. You know, whether that is, I've got $100, I'm gonna go to the casino, or when the Powerball's high, I'm, I'm gonna buy a ticket or two because it's a fun, dinner conversation to say, what would you do if you won the Powerball? If you had a couple hundred million dollars, what would you do? Um, I sometimes ask that when I give talks. It's hilarious, the answers I got. Best answer I ever got was a young woman who said, I would buy shoes. <laughs> <laughs> the worst answer I got, somebody said, I would invest it. 
And I'm like, invested for what? Are you nuts? But we still have about one to 2% of the population that meet a diagnostic criterion for having a gambling problem. Criterion I'll get to in a second. And another three to 5% who are intermittently or um, intermittently meet criterion or seem to meet criterion, or they sort of have some symptoms but never really quite meet criterion. We translate that to Tennessee. Um, we're talking about the fact that in their lifetime, uh, we're going to have 100,000 citizens in Tennessee, adults, this is based on adult numbers, with a gambling problem. But we're also going to have well over a quarter million people who are experiencing gambling-related harms. And the issue around this is harms, as well as the diagnosis. Every person who has a gambling problem impacts six other people in their lives. This is a study. I didn't believe it when it first came out in New Zealand, but it has been replicated in a couple other data sets. And it appears as though one person with a problem has approximately six people that will realize harm, oftentimes financial harm, but also harm to the honesty and security of relationships, um, as well as all the way down to crime. Uh, we estimate that about 9% of our clients have committed a crime. Almost none of them will admit to have committed a crime, but they've committed a crime in order to get money to gamble. We actually had one uh, client one time who had gotten arrested outside a gaming facility. This guy pretty much just stuck his hand in his jacket, jacket and held up a guy. You know, and if anybody's ever spent any time in a casino, everything is being monitored on camera, so he didn't go anywhere and was arrested. But he said, I, I, I didn't think. this. I was just taking the money he won. So it wasn't really his money. That was the rationalization to it. Um, the diagnostic criterion, there are nine symptoms. In order to meet diagnostic criterion, you must identify that you, in the last 12 months, have experienced four of them. Um, and they're listed here. And I'm going to give you a quick course to it. The most common one that people experience is what's called chasing. Chasing is when you lose money and you keep on going trying to win that money back. Now, the reality of the matter is that's common um, in that 60% of people who gamble will say they've, been, they've done this. So it's not a really good diagnostic criterion. It is, I think, part of human nature to sort of do this. And most people, some people are risk intolerant. If they lose money, they pull back immediately. But most of us think that, oh, wait a minute, I can get that back. So that's the most common and not very diagnostically informative. At a subclinical letter, when it says problems, what we see is people start reporting preoccupation with gambling, that they gamble when they're distressed or lonely, and that mm, they try to hide it. Okay. Well, you know, something you hear quite often about gambling is it's a hidden addiction, which in some ways I'm confused by. But on the other hand, what we find over and over again is it can happen without anybody really, anybody else really knowing about it, particularly when we're talking about gambling on apps. Uh, sense of time, I'm not giving you all this. I've, you know, we've treated probably over 1,300 people now with gambling problems. Uh, for some reason, the state put my desk number on their website, so which is good because I actually get to talk to people very directly when they call wanting information. So, uh, that's good. <coughs> Now, but to talk about diagnostic criterion. Diagnostic criterion is primarily around this whole idea of addiction, and that is tolerance, more and more engagement to get the same effect. That you experience withdrawal, that trying to stop doing it is hard or is distressing in some ways, and that harm has occurred, which are kind of the three cornerstone diagnoses for a for an addiction problem. And in gambling, that will most likely appear first as a harm to a relationship. The most severe forms of gambling, so the people who probably have all of these diagnostic symptoms, the last one to come up is desperate attempt to get money. And uh, incredibly sad stories from people, uh, you know, from people who, you know, live in their car and then sell the car in order to gamble. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sad. And, um, and these people, you know, they, one of the things about gamblers and treating gamblers as opposed to people with uh, substance use addiction, 
gamblers have hope. Um, <laughs> they actually think the next time I'll go gamble. And it's what makes gambling different. Nobody goes drinking thinking that tomorrow morning the world will be fine. My world will be fixed. But people gamble thinking the next day I wake up, all my problems might be solved because I am one win away from fixing everything. One of my saddest stories I ever had was a woman who came in, actually had complicated reasons, but she actually took a second mortgage out on their house. Um, they were so far in debt, her husband had no idea. And she sat there and said, wait a minute, if I get the treatment, then it means I can't win my money back. I just want one more chance to win that back. We never saw her again. It's really it's a very sad mm -hmm. video in Supervision mm -hmm. Watch. Here's what's, this, this is very recent data. In fact, we're writing this paper right now. And that is we, we did a study. This is, a, I think this study has 800 people in here. And in here, we asked them whether or not they thought they had a gambling problem. And then we later in the survey give them questions to say, to red flag them whether or not they have a problem or not. And what we found is that, um, yeah, this is not the best. I don't want to put this slide up. Uh, what we found was 40, if you don't have a problem, you know you don't have a problem. But if you actually screen as having a problem, 44% of the people who screen positive as a problem say, no, I don't have any problem. It's that awareness of the problem that is evasive to the individual themselves. Um, treatment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that story because it's a really cool one, I think. Um, but let me talk a little bit about treatment because these are good news. These are um, this this column over the uh, the um, uh, vertical axis is something called an effect size. And if you're not a researcher, you don't care about effect size. For us, we live and die for it. Effect size is how much is something for in a treatment. How much is the treatment helping? And a small effect size is sort of a bump is when it's in the 0.2 to 0.3 range. When you get up to 0.4 to 0.5, that's a pretty good size effect size. And if you get above that, that's screaming good. I mean, that means, yeah, this treatment works pretty well. And so here are various different treatments for uh, modalities been, been, uh, 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 been used in what's called a random clinical trial. Random clinical trials are like the epitome of the best way to evaluate if the treatment is better than non-treatment or a faux treatment. And what we find is drugs don't really work. Opioid antagonists work a little bit, but medications that have been used and tried with uh, individual gambling problems are not that effective. Brief interventions, which means one meeting usually. This, there's some... There's some details where it would help and some details where it won't. But brief interventions give you a little bit of bump, as well as do self-guided or self-help books. Um, well, and they're, they're okay, and it gives people a nudge in the right direction. But what's really interesting here, as we move to online, face-to-face, -face, and this last column is called CBT and MI, which is a certain form of face-to-face -face treatment based on cognitive behavior therapy. And what we see is we've got an effect size that's up around 0.8. This effect size tells us that <clears throat> different analysis you can do of that study, and it shows that well over 80% of the people that enter treatment will realize a significant gain. Now, there are people that the treatment won't work for, and there are some people who actually end up looking a little worse after treatment, but in general, the, this form of intervention is highly effective when people will engage in complete the treatment. So what does that mean to engage in complete the treatment? Or what, what effects will they have? And the big effect that they'll have is they'll have a great reduction in symptoms. Okay, that list of nine things, it drops. In our clinic, we monitor it all the time. In the last 12 months, on average, people walk in the door with almost seven of the nine symptoms. Um, one month after treatment, um, they're averaging um, about 0.05 symptoms. So it almost eliminates treatment. We also find they get significant reductions in both their gambling frequency as well as gambling intensity. Gambling intensity is really thought about as um, 
how much money do you wager in a specific amount of time or each time you go wage, you go gamble or are, are you reducing that and I, I we pay attention to those things because we do not require we have an we our approach in the cbtmi approach is about how to help people bring their capacity into focus on this problem most human beings have capacity we have adaptive abilities to successfully deal with the world how do we bring those to bear or develop other skills in order to intervene them? But we also, this is really interesting, this is a paper we just published um, in January, uh, and that is across all random clinical trials. Really interesting. The interventions focused on targeting the gambling behavior, but we also find insul insul insulary changes in people's well being, being that they've experienced decreased. Uh, depression, decreased anxiety, and an increased sense of well-being. So treatment really works, but we have a huge problem with treatment. That huge problem is, and this is this is data that's been true 20 years ago, oh, 30 years ago, and it's still true today, and that is only one out of 10 people who have a problem walk in the door. Um, so uh, and it's a big part of what we're doing is trying to figure out how do we increase that awareness. Remember I pointed out, 44% of the people aren't even aware they have a problem. How do we help people get that awareness? And how do we help them get in the door? How do we give them hope about, yeah, treatment could help. So there are big problems getting people in the door. But our second problem is getting people, uh, I skipped a line here, getting people to um, complete treatment. Uh, there is no evidence for inpatient treatment for gambling problems. There absolutely is no published study about it. It's not even proving it doesn't work. There's no study about it. That doesn't bother me. I don't really care. I don't, I don't think that's the right mode. It has to do with my philosophies and, and beliefs about change. Um, but what we do, what, and group treatments can work, although there's not a lot of great evidence for it. What we do in our treatment is we work individually with people because we want to tailor and focus the intervention on what's happening for you and the problems that you are having. So we do one-on-one, -on -one, and this literature points to the fact that people need to try to meet eight to 10 times in order to effectively receive a dose that'll yield a change that I just talked about. So, so while we know we get people to treatment, we know only one out of 10 are gonna show up, and then we also know that 40% of them will drop out of treatment or discontinue treatment and they discontinue treatment for a variety of reasons that's a whole nother hour talk um but that um, <laughs> so of those people that come to treatment though we know we can make a substantive change in their life oh so that's that's our team here in memphis um i don't know where i'm at with time i think oh good i'm right on time um the uh, uh we also have a parallel team East Tennessee. Uh, it keeps me off the streets and out of trouble. But I also think I, I, it, it actually, so I, uh, full disclosure, I'm a Catholic boy, um, avoiding purgatory, like what my life goal is. And uh, and I keep on, my joke is always that, you know, I feel like the work we've gotten to do and our contributions have lessened my time in purgatory unless maybe I've increased my time. <laughs> well, the balance, I think I'm doing really pretty okay now. <laughs> um, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can, although um, let me tell you that um, most of the medical interventions uh, for substance use is aimed at the substance, not the psychological well-being. So part of that difference is that the addiction to a substance, there are some treatments 
uh, that can mitigate those harms and help someone control the behavior. So methadone and related uh, 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 drugs can, anti-opioids um, can work and help control that physical drive. But it's not, I'm, I'm stopping myself from getting into a lecture that I would, I can argue for you. I don't know if I'm right, but I can make an argument for you that all, all addictions are fundamentally at its core a behavioral addiction. The substance, the addiction to the substance often abates pretty quickly. You know, so for example, nicotine's, the half-life of nicotine in your body is three to five days. Um, when you, if you've gone three to five days without consuming nicotine, you're no longer physically addicted to the nicotine, but yet months later, years later, the urge to smoke, which is triggered by contextual variables, not by physical variables. So that, that's, that's a key element. Other than that, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, well, first of all, there, the, the best evidence we have is that a behavioral addiction like gambling um, appears to um, use the same neurological pathways as do drives to or urges to engage in substance abuse addiction. So from a neurochemistry point of view, we can argue them being very, very similar. Um, the, um, and that, uh, that, so it begs why, you know, that maybe we don't have different risk factors. And in general, many of those risk factors are very similar. I think that if you're gonna target way, what might be some differences, um, um, one, I think impulsivity works a little different with behavioral addictions than they do with substance abuse addictions. Number two, it's social context. I think there are social variables. Uh, like right now, like the world's on fire, meaning the United States, but that's all we actually think about. But the United States is on fire about all these young men gambling. Well, guess, guess what? If we were wagering online, you know, remotely on uh, different sort of things, we'd see more women involved. But you look at the audience for sports, and it's a lot of men. You know, so so those kind of cultural things drive, uh, and they're different for gambling than it is for many of the drugs. Another different risk factors is. Is a, is a very confusing story. We know that um, with uh, substance use addictions, that in, in throughout adolescence, we you know the, the world thinks about gateway drugs. It's not about gateway drugs. There are three three possible routes to gaining an um, uh, involvement in an addictive element as an adolescence, and that is there's some individual characteristics like impulsivity. There are a few others. There is social context, peer group, and then there's family. And families oftentimes drive is the biggest driver for that, you know, not not various things in families. We don't quite have that with gambling. The evidence doesn't quite point it out that way, except for families. Um, if a parent has a gambling problem, uh, the mo one of the strongest predictor of an individual having a gambling problem is their report that their parent had a gambling problem. Um, uh, so I, that's the best I can. It's the best I can do. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Yeah. So this is uh, this is an this is a U.S sort of thing, this whole idea of abstinence is the only route to gaining control. Um, you, if you go to an addiction group in, even in Canada, but in, in like Europe, um, no one talks about abstinence. Abstinence is because, so AA, which is a very important part of our culture, uh, it's very important help for those who have alcohol problems. Um, it is a grassroots movement to say people need to get together and support each other. People with shared histories, they support each other. 
But if you take a look at the 12 steps, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a grassroots, not necessarily a scientifically driven one. Um, but what we know from the evidence is that there's a, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a huge project called Project Match. Project Match was a federally funded study to treat um, alcohol. And what they were trying to figure out is what treatments or what person sort of set it. And what they found in the end is, hmm, we don't know. So they compared, they compared basically a 12-step treatment to a cognitive behavioral treatment to a brief, sort of brief two to three session intervention. And what they found is they all work on average about the same. And that we can't figure out who they work better or worse for. They're just different ways to approach the problem. The 12 step method works when it works for you. The biggest problem with the 12 step abstinence model, it engages a very, very small percentage of those people who have that problem. So when it works, it works. So when people call me and say, you know, I've been going to you know, a GA meeting, gambler anomalous meeting, and you know, it seems to be working for me. Do you think I should come into treatment? I'm like, if it's working for you, no, keep that rolling. You know, if that works for you, keep it rolling. But that model is hard to ask research questions about. And fundamental to it is, is that need to be abstinent. Are there things you, you should really be abstinent from? Yeah, nicotine, uh, or at least smoking in particular. Um, opioids would be good. Yeah, be good. But but the truth is, there are people who can maintain half their life on a um, opio opioid antagonist, and they're fine, or you know, being the methadone treatment, and, and they're coping. So, so this idea of we we force abstinence is a U.S. thing, and the rest of the world doesn't believe in it. Our approach is like a substance use addiction, and the rest of the world is harm reduction. How do we help you reduce the harms in your life? Harm in my life, eating cookies. <laughs> Serious. I'd be a slender, good-looking guy. No, that's exactly it. My wife brought me home a cookie yesterday. I did eat it. She's an enabler. She's an enabler. She said, I brought you a surprise, and I know you don't want it. Because uh, I, eat, I, I see a cookie, and I think, this may be the very last cookie I ever <laughs> have in my life. Should I pass it up? It's a tough, it's tough. Other questions? Yeah. All right, so here's, yeah, no, 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 this, this, this to me is the biggest problem that we really are facing. And that is we have a wall of advertising we don't have a lot of evidence about what the effects of this, but they're advertising. I and mean, these people get paid to make us want to buy things. Um, uh, we do have data from Australia. So what I, what I always look at, I look at the Australians. I look at the Australians and I look at the UK. I want to look at the UK to, to understand what decisions you can make which are completely wrong. UK has reliably made absolutely stupid decisions about gambling. And they just came out with a report this month on this new thing they're doing. It's like, that's stupid too. <laughs> and then I pay attention to the Australians. Because the Australians have had, they're like a decade ahead of us in everything we do in the gambling world. So I just go pay attention to what those people are doing. And I steal their ideas. And I bring them here. One of the things they've revealed is that Advertising has, there are two groups you have to be concerned about with advertising, and that is adolescents, and that is that you're modeling and, and curating for them that this is an okay, good thing to do and an easy way to make money. And then people who have, have gambling problems. Advertising to people who have gambling problems is a bad thing. It's like pouring a drink for somebody who says, no, I don't want to drink, or for your wife to bring you home cookies when you're trying not to eat them. Um, uh, our, our problem in the United States is Nevada is incredibly regulated when it comes to um, uh, gambling because they've been doing it so long. A lot of it's shady. You know, you can look at decisions. It's kind of interesting. And there are whole people that comment on this all the time. But they are very mature in regulating. 
the rest of the country, there are people who are on these boards who are creating regulations and they know nothing about the industry. They know nothing about responsible gambling. I, I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just making up rules without knowing what the impact of those rules are. And if you're a member of the Tennessee Sports Wagering Council, uh, I apologize and come talk to me. I know no one in this room is. I know who these people are. I've presented to them several times and they don't, they, they, they just don't get it. Um, so that's, that's my answer to that. Yeah, no, we need regulations, particularly around, there's a bunch of changes in regulations that are needed in Tennessee, but we're not there yet. Oh, yeah. And it's not, no. No, there's all these caveats on how you get that $1,000. And it's only $1,000 to wager with. You don't get, yeah, you don't get those stuff. Yeah, no, it's just a complete sham. Yeah, and there needs to be regulations around it. Yeah, that seems just wrong. So if you want to pay attention in, in the United in, in Tennessee, um, BetMGM and Caesars both have very mature, responsible gaming people involved. Some of the other operators, I'm not going to say, let's just let's just like if one was called DraftKings, for example. I don't know if there is one called DraftKings. Uh, maybe the other one's called FanDuel. FanDuel said everything in life's a bet. You know, that if you're betting if the milk is sour, which is the stupidest thing I ever heard. Because who drinks milk without first seeing if it's not sour? No, it doesn't happen. But the um, but they actually hired people. Um, it's another long story, and they don't pay attention to them. Um, there needs to be regulations. That's That's the bottom line. Yes. Oh. Oh, they're good. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, but a 14-year-old can come to you and give you money to wager with. They can't catch that. Yeah, no, they're really good. They're, uh, it's, yeah, it's not 14. 14-year-olds 14 are not on app sports wagering. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hi, Tilly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, you can go directly to your.